Hello and welcome to this video lecture for the University of Connecticut's online course, Classics and Ancient Mediterranean Studies 1103, Classical Mythology. I'm Roger Travis, Associate Professor of Classics at the University of Connecticut, and whether you're enrolled in this course or not, I hope you enjoy the lecture and learn something about new ways of looking at classics and at myth. Thanks for watching. Now it's my great pleasure to be able to talk about the character of Penelope and what she has to do with the mythic themes that I'm bringing out as we make our way through the Odyssey. My favorite place to start talking about Penelope is in book 19 of the Odyssey, right at line 123. Penelope and Odysseus are having their famous interview and one of my interpretations of the Odyssey is that Penelope actually has a very strong suspicion that it's Odysseus that she's talking to right now. But one thing to remember about the social situation in the Odyssey is that there's no time when Penelope and Odysseus would be unobserved. You have to remember that these houses are mostly just large halls and that the famously treacherous serving maids, the ones who have been sleeping with the suitors, are all around and will report whatever it is that Penelope does in terms of her trickery to try to avoid marriage with the suitors to the suitors. Remember that the backstory of Penelope that we hear a couple of times is the way that she did the famous weaving trick and said she needed to weave a shroud for Odysseus's father Laertes and then she would weave it during the day and unravel it at night and that went on for a long long time until finally she was betrayed by her serving maids. These same serving maids are right there ready to report on anything Penelope says to this beggar, anything this beggar who of course is actually Odysseus says to Penelope. So even if Penelope does suspect that Odysseus is Odysseus and Odysseus suspects that Penelope suspects that Odysseus is Odysseus, they can't say anything. I think that at least one bard was having a lot of fun trying to get his audience to see that in fact there's a kind of coded conversation between Penelope and Odysseus going back and forth here. Now I don't have the time to get as far into that as I could, so I highly recommend taking a course in Greek epic where you'll get to get very deep into this facet of the Odyssey and of the character of Penelope. But be that as it may, there's one moment in what Penelope says to beggar Odysseus that really does bear very heavily on the question of what the relationship is of the character of Penelope to the mythic themes of the Odyssey, the themes of the true man, the Andra, of what it means to be a hero, what it means to be the hero of an epic, and what it means to be the hero of a myth. So here's Penelope at line 123 of book 19 of the Odyssey. Circumspect Penelope said to him in answer, Stranger, all of my excellence, my beauty and figure were ruined by the immortals at that time when the Argives took ship for Ilion, and with them went my husband Odysseus. If he were to come back to me and take care of my life, then my reputation would be more great and splendid. As it is now, I grieve. Such evils the god has let loose upon me. For all the greatest men who have the power in the islands, in Dulichion and Same and in wooded Zakynthos, and all who in rocky Ithaca are holders of lordships, all these are my suitors against my will, and they wear my house out. Therefore I pay no attention to strangers, nor to suppliants, nor yet to heralds who are in the public service, but always I waste away at the inward heart, longing for Odysseus. These men try to hasten the marriage. I weave my own wiles. The dominant element here is Penelope trying to get sympathy from the person that she is talking to. She is expressing how sad she is and she wants both her immediate audience, the beggar here, and the audience of the epic to feel for her. And we should feel for her. She's in a terrible position, and it's one of the things that makes the Odyssey the wonderful epic it is, that her character is so sympathetic. But there's another facet here that's absolutely fascinating, and it appears strongly when we compare this passage to an earlier passage. In Book 18, you may remember, Penelope has that moment where she's inspired to come down 
to face the suitors and she looks really, really good, meaning really hot because along with the double determination way that these things happen, Athena has made her look very, very good. Now, remembering the way double determination works, this just means that Penelope is, in fact, really hot, especially for the older woman that she now is. And she makes all of the suitors sit up and notice. And they say uh, in book 18 that she is the most incredible looking woman they've ever seen. In fact, Eurymachus says around line 245 of book 18, Daughter of Icaria, circumspect Penelope, if only all the Achaeans in Iad Argos could see you at dawn of day tomorrow, there would be even more suitors come to feast in your house, since you surpass all women for beauty and stature and for the mind well balanced within you. But the really interesting thing here is what Penelope says to him in answer. This is at line 250 of book 18 of the Odyssey. Circumspect Penelope said to him in answer, Eurymachus, all my excellence, my beauty and figure were ruined by the immortals at that time when the Argives took ship for Ilion, and with them went my husband Odysseus. If he were to come back to me and take care of my life, then my reputation would be more great and splendid. As it is now, I grieve. Such evils the god has let loose upon me when he went and left me behind in the land of his fathers. And she continues on, but you could tell that the beginning of that is exactly the same as the beginning of what she says to the beggar. Well, what's going on here? One thing is, as we know, when bards are orally recomposing the epics night after night, they're bound to reuse some things, and that's part of the poetic system. But in the days of their greatest creativity, they certainly weren't required to reuse exactly the same words the way the bard of book 18 and the bard of book 19, who are frankly probably the same bard, reuse exactly the same words. That is, the bard's using precisely these same few lines indicates that the bard wants us to realize that Penelope has this speech down. That is, she is very, very good at eliciting sympathy. And why does she do it in book 18? Well, if you continue on in this passage, it's because she wants better gifts from the suitors. Here we are at line 277. Such men themselves bring in their own cattle and fat sheep to feast the family of the bride and offer glorious presents. They do not eat up another's livelihood without payment. She spoke, and much enduring great Odysseus was happy because she beguiled gifts out of them and enchanted their spirits with blandishing words while her own mind had other intentions. First thing here, who is it besides Penelope that we know likes presents? Well, obviously it's Odysseus, and one of the things that I don't get a chance to pay as much attention to as I'd like to in this course is Odysseus and his relation to this thing called Xenia. Xenia is guest friendship and it was more or less the way the economy functioned in the ancient times of archaic Greece when there wasn't a lot of trade going back and forth. Xenia was a system of guest friendship whereby people would give presents to each other and Odysseus is clearly the master of this. One of the things that happens with the Phaeacians of course is that he gets them to to give him a ton of presents. Here Penelope is doing exactly the same thing and it makes Odysseus happy. Why? Well, first of all, because it means more presents for his house, but second of all, because it means that Penelope is like him, that he has in her the perfect wife who can get presents the same way that he gets presents. And this is the concept that I'm going to explore more fully in the next segment.